So we are at a geothermal power plant in Iceland, Reykjavik, right now, and we're about to get a tour. Let's, Let's go. go. Okay, so about to take our tour for the geothermal exhibition power plants. Let's go. You guys are doing a project about greenhouses, right? Yes. Yeah. Can you so, tell me a little bit about it? So we're looking about uh, building a geothermal greenhouse on Nantucket because uh, in the winter they have to ship some food from the mainland all the way to Nantucket, and that creates CO two in the air, and we don't we don't want that. Yeah. So we're building a greenhouse on Nantucket for a school project. That's fantastic! What an exciting school project. Yeah. Yes. And kind of along some themes of sustainability and yeah, fantastic. Okay. Well, so as you might know, Iceland has a lot of geothermal energy. We also have a lot of greenhouses. So for this tour, we're going to start here with this map and a little bit of geology. Okay. After that, we're going to go upstairs and talk about the production and the distribution of this power plant. And we can also see into the plant itself. Okay. So this is the Hekluskeri geothermal power plant. It's the largest geothermal power plant in Iceland, one of the largest in the entire world. Here we produce both electricity that goes to Iceland's national grid and hot water for the capital region. We like to start with the map and a bit of geology because it helps to explain not only why Iceland exists, but why we have so many geothermal areas in the country. There are two main reasons for this. The first is this orange line. Do you guys have any guesses as to what that might be? Um, maybe. Heat, like, um, cheese is there? Yeah, so this represents a tectonic plate boundary. So this is where the North American and the Eurasian tectonic plates are separating at an average rate of about two centimeters a year, so not very much. But all of this tectonic activity in turn causes both seismic and volcanic activity, and it's the volcanism especially that contributes to the overall presence of geothermal. So. You see here, it goes onto the Reykjanes Peninsula. This is where the airport is that you guys flew in. Yeah. Last year and the year before, we had a volcanic eruption on this peninsula. Mm. Last year, the week before the eruption started, we had over 10,000 earthquakes in this peninsula alone. And last year, across the whole country, around 45,000. So there's quite a lot of activity going on. A lot of geologists think that Askja, this volcano here, might erupt soon. But soon, in geological terms, could mean six months. It could be 100 years. So we'll see what happens with that. So this is one reason why we have so many geothermal areas. The second reason is this yellow spot, which represents a hot spot. Are you guys familiar with hot spots? Um, kind of. Yeah, that's no problem at all. We're just going to cover all our bases here. So a hot spot is a manifestation of mantle plume. So you can think of it just like a big column of magma material underneath the Earth's surface. I think Yellowstone and Hawaii, both in the United States, are two really famous hotspots that people have heard of. But it's incredibly rare that you get both a divergent or a separating plate boundary and a hotspot overlapping. So it's the combination of these two things that explains why Iceland has so many geothermal areas that we can use. These geothermal areas are represented on the map with the blue and the red dots. The blue dots are called low temperature fields, and I'm guessing this is what you guys are going to be working with in Nantucket. So by definition, a low temperature field, at least for us here, has water at a depth of one kilometer that ranges from 30 to 150 degrees Celsius. So it can be a bit above boiling point in some of the hotter ones. We can use these low temperature fields for water to use for space heating, including greenhouses. Over 90% of all buildings and homes in the country are heated using geothermal water. We, of course, have quite a lot of greenhouses. We have outdoor pools that we use year round, and also in a lot of places, we will have pipes that run under the streets and sidewalks to melt the snow and ice floors in the winter. So we have a lot that we can make use of. 
To produce electricity, though, like we're doing here, you need to be in one of these red dots, which is a high temperature field. By definition, those areas have water, again, at just a depth of one kilometer. That is 200 degrees Celsius or hotter. Right now, we're in this high temperature field here. The production wells that we have drilled down to an average depth of two kilometers, and the water that we work with is around 300 degrees, or I think that's around 570 Fahrenheit. So it gets really, really hot, but it is this heat that allows us to produce what we produce. So, since you guys are focusing on greenhouses, if you have any questions about geology, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I think it makes the most sense that we go upstairs to talk about how we're actually producing and using the water. Okay. okay. Sounds good to you? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to head all the way up to the top floor. Either I'm going to grab a lift, you guys are welcome to come with me, or you can take the stairs, whatever you prefer. Fantastic. So just all the way up to the top floor. God, that view. Jeez. Well, that's a, it's a good place to build this. Oh my God. So here we're going to talk about us as a power plant. So when we're looking for a place to build a power plant, we need to have three different variables. Number one is an active heat source, and you can see ours kind of dramatically through the steam here. It's this mountain behind us. This mountain is part of an active volcanic system called the Hanging system. So that's what's giving us the heat that we need because there's quite a bit of magma beneath the Earth's surface here. The second thing we need is a lot of water. And this comes to us in the form of different precipitation and glacial milk that then becomes groundwater. The third and final thing we need is then the right kind of bedrock. So we're looking for a favorable, permeable bedrock. Iceland is about 90% basalt. Have you guys heard of basalt? Yes. So it's a very porous type of volcanic rock, right? Yes. The porousness or the holes in that bedrock allow the water when it reaches here to move easily through it. So it moves through until it reaches us here, near the magma, our heat source, and then it warms up becoming geothermal water. And that's where we come in as a power plant. Since visibility is really good today, did you guys notice any of these silver igloo looking things on your way in? Yes. Fantastic. So some of these are what we call production wells, and that's what we're using to bring the water up for us to use. At an average depth of two kilometers, even though the water is well above boiling point, it's still in liquid form. Do you guys know why? Uh, because it's... Uh... Hot? Yeah, I mean, it is hot, yes. Um, so normally when water gets to boiling point, it becomes steam, right? Yeah. But the reason that it stays in liquid form in the ground is because the pressure of the earth is a lot greater. So it's keeping, you know how, like when you're in a submarine underwater, there's a lot more pressure there? It's a similar thing here. So this pressure is keeping it in liquid form. But as we extract it, this water rises, the pressure of the earth decreases the closer you get to the surface. So at the top end as well, we do end up with water that cools to below boiling, but also huge amounts of steam and some geothermal gases. That's brought to us through the pipes that you can see out the window going at 90 degree angles, and then they enter the tanks right in front of us here. How these turbines work is basically the velocity of the steam being forced through the turbine creates power. This power is then sent into a generator where it's converted into electricity, and then the electricity is sent straight to the national grid. So we're producing 303 megawatts of electricity here. And since it is a little bit loud, maybe we move over here so we can hear a bit better. So we can think of one megawatt as being enough electricity at any given moment for about 1,000 people. Iceland has around 380,000 people that live here, so technically, if we're producing 303 megawatts, this plant alone supplies almost enough for the entire country, right? But, there's always a but when we're talking about these kinds of things, Iceland actually has quite a lot of industry. About 83% of all the electricity produced on the island goes to industry. Aluminum smelting and fishing are two of the biggest ones, so it's a pretty small percentage that's used by people in their daily lives like us. For the hot water, which is, I'm guessing, what you guys are most interested in, have you been to the Blue Lagoon already? Yes. Yes, okay. So when you were there, you noticed that kind of the silica in the water. Yeah. It's, yeah, we have that same thing here. So because of this silica, or the minerals in the water, we can't use the water directly in the heat exchange, or in the heat process, because it would cause scaling or clogging in the pipes, which we don't want. So we use a heat exchange process. So this geothermal water is used to heat up fresh cold groundwater 
to about 85, 86 degrees Celsius, and that's what we then send to the capital region. We can see here a cross section of the piping that we use for the water transport. So you notice it's pretty big. It also has that layer of insulation, and what we're yeah. using is called drop. Yeah. And it's just is very efficient, so we are losing less than two degrees of temperature in a transfer of about 25 kilometers. And that's probably not very exciting for you guys, but it is a really impressive number, I can guarantee you that. After this, so we've produced electricity, we've sent hot water to the capital region, we re-inject that geothermal water back into the bedrock upstream of our own production wells to help maintain levels over time, and then we're left with geothermal gases, including CO2, like you guys were talking about downstairs. So we have in a geothermal area these natural gases, both CO2 and also H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide. So if you notice a sulfur or an eggy smell outside while you're here, this is why. Just like you guys are thinking about, we don't want to release what we're bringing up into the atmosphere, right? So because of this, we're working with our sister company Carbfix to permanently store this gas. We're capturing the gas in a scrubbing tower behind us here, and then dissolving it in water and re-injecting this back down into the bedrock. And this is a very kind of fun, exciting project. It was developed here in the power plant, but because of how we're injecting it back down in, it's speeding up a naturally occurring process. So over the course of about two years, these gases turn to stone. More specifically, they're mineralizing, and I can show you a sample of what this looks like. So here in our rocks and mineral collection, we have a carb fix sample, is what we're calling it. These sparkling bits that you can see in the rock here are the mineralized gas. So again, after about two years, the CO2 and the H2S mineralize. So the CO2 becomes calcite and the H2S becomes pyrite or fool's gold. And once it mineralizes, it is permanently stored in the bedrock. This is a pretty exciting technology. Anywhere in the world that you have basaltic bedrock and water, you can utilize this. So there are places in the U.S. that could be doing this also, for an example. Do you guys have any questions so far? Okay, no problem. So when we're talking about greenhouses, Iceland has a lot of greenhouses. Some of them are in high temperature fields, some of them are in low temperature fields, but all of our greenhouses, to my knowledge, are using water. So we're using heat pumps. Do you guys know what a heat pump is? Yes. Exactly. So we're pumping water down into the ground so it can be heated up naturally, then bringing it up to heat the greenhouses. The greenhouses that we have here, most of them, or the industrial ones at least, also have uh, computers and sensors. So it's constantly measuring the humidity and the temperature inside. So if it becomes too hot or humid, it will notify the sensor and then it will cause like a, the roof to open a bit so it can adjust the temperature and humidity. And we can also show you guys into the power plant itself, if you would like. Yes, please. Let's check it out. So we're going to head over here. And after the tour, you're also welcome to go outside. We have some really nice views from the observation deck here. Lower down, it grades into magma, which is probably contained within magma chambers. Welcome to the actual power plant. From time part. to time, magma may flow up into these chambers from further down the road. Wow. Holy. Here we have four of the six high pressure turbines that we're using. So the actual turbine is this part over here that you can see. This is the generator. So the steam is being forced through the turbine here where it creates power. Then it's sent to the generator right in front of us where that power is converted to electricity. And then we send it off to the national grid. So it's happening right now. You can kind of feel and hear the humming. Those are the turbines working. Wow, that's, that's amazing. It's pretty cool stuff, definitely. So. So basically what's bought here is uh, tomato, cucumber, and also banana. We also have a lot of different kinds of lettuce. We have broccoli, we have cauliflower. Some of this is grown outdoors, of course. We have potatoes and carrots as well. But because of the greenhouses, we can have access to fresh produce all year round, which is pretty good for an island in the North Atlantic. Wow. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, what are the other two turbines? The other two turbines are located about a kilometer out of here, so they're offset. So these were the first four, and then we had two more built. Or maybe those were the first and these were the second. But the power plant was built in five different stages, so they were adding the turbines in these stages, so it wasn't all ready at once. Some of them are production wells, which is what we're using to bring up. Some of them are re-injection wells, where we're re-injecting the geothermal fluid, and then some are actually the carb fix wells. So that's where the carb fixes re-injecting the CO2 and H2S in water. 
Um, I think 300 to 500 meters, uh, and then it just goes from there. They are also working on the coding terminal, which is going to be close to the airport when it's finished. That's going to be an international shipping hub for countries from all over the world to send the CO2 that they capture to Iceland to be stored in the bedrock here. And for that project, I think they are drilling much deeper, but I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. What are the five stages of the turbines? Um, so the five stages is how the power plant was built. So we had you know, two turbines, and then two turbines, and then two turbines added. You know, it was built in those kinds of stages. For the stages of how the turbines are used, it's the steam into the turbine, then into the generator to be converted from power to electricity, and then to the national grid. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. OK, fantastic. So if you guys don't have any more questions now, we do have some films that we can show you, both about the geology, also about carp fix, and if you're very interested, one on the IDDP, which is the International Deep Drilling Project, where they're trying to reach super critical steam just to have a higher efficiency rate. And then you guys are absolutely welcome to explore everything you see here. Again, you can go out on the decks. We have displays here and one floor below. And if you think of any questions at all, please find me or one of my colleagues downstairs because we love talking about this and we're more than happy to continue. Okay. All right, thank you. So this is the mineralized gas that um, she was talking about earlier. See, you can see the crystals a little bit more. Take a look around.